Hello, so today we are going to be looking at um, a poem called Afternoons by Philip Larkin. The good news is we have two poems left until we have, most of you should have done all of the poems in the anthology. So we're going to revise first of all symbolism. Okay, what is symbolism? And what does the changing of the seasons symbolise in To Autumn by John Keats? We did that um, around about Christmas time this year. Pause the video, answer those questions. So symbolism is when something represents something else. So in To Autumn, the change or the seasons represent the cycle of life. So autumn into winter is this idea of life into death and that is something that the seasons symbolize into autumn and it's actually something that we're going to pick up on in afternoons a little bit later on in the lesson so monotony then um monotony means or something is monotonous it's a lack of variety and interest something tedious repetitive something routine it's basically something very boring if something's monotonous it's boring it's the same every day there's no variety it's dull it's uninteresting so in what way do you think adult life might be monotonous or maybe even your own lives currently do you think might be you know what are some of the monotonous boring everyday routine things that we have to do in life and our sort of aiming higher question is how might you link the idea of monotony to a wife in London? Can you think about how we might link this concept of monotony to a wife in London? So you can pause the video and answer those questions. So you might argue um, school is monotonous. Obviously, we're not in school and actually I'd like to think that many of you like me actually really miss that day to day routine of being in school and maybe if anything, this absolutely extraordinarily bizarre pandemic isolation experience will teach us to not um, take for granted some of those things that we previously um, thought was rather monotonous and boring. I would love to be able to go back in tomorrow and be told it could just be a regular, normal sort of school day, as I'm sure many of you would. Um, but again, before the pandemic, you might have said, well, school's monotonous, it's every day's the same, it's a routine. And again, as you become an adult, um, get up, go to work, your work life could be monotonous. Um, maybe having children, having to look after a house, pay your bills, do the washing up, move your floor, take, do your children a packed lunch, take them to school, put them to bed. That actually life at whatever stage maybe tends to be full of these routines that you can't really get away from. And that idea of monotony and the routine of everyday life, particularly domestic life, is one that is predominantly focused on in the poem we're going to look at today. So the idea of monotony in a wife in London, then we'll think about the start of the poem. We're introduced to this woman, this lonely, sad woman sitting by the fire, waiting for news of her husband. And you can imagine the monotony of her life, this lonely, isolated woman sitting every day by herself, waiting for news of her husband. So again, it's a very monotonous, very dull, very miserable, negative existence, which is, of course, is deliberate because Thomas Hardy is wanting to create a negative idea about the Boer War. And you remember, he thought it was pointless and selfish and greedy. So this woman's life is monotonous because she doesn't have anyone to share it with and never will again, because unfortunately, her husband has died, as we find out. So today we're going to analyse how Larkin presents the themes of love and relationships, passage of time and place in afternoons. And these are some of the themes or ideas that he picks up on. So you'll know who Philip Larkin was, why he wrote afternoons, how he uses language form and structure to present all of those themes. So we're looking at how he presents love and relationships, the passage of time um, and the idea of place. 
So as always, we know that we need some contextual information about the poem and the time he was writing it in. So you may want to write some of these notes in your own words, either on your sheet of paper or if you have a copy of the poem in front of you at, in that bottom um, sort of blank space. So he was born in 1922, died in 1985. He was an English poet, novelist and librarian. He was homeschooled until the age of eight. and He had few friends and close relationships in the early stages of his life. He studied English at Oxford University. And whilst he was an adult, you know, old enough to enlist in World War II because he wore glasses and had very poor eyesight, he could not serve in the army. He was generally someone who was very unsuccessful in love. He never married, he never had children, but he did have lots of different short term relationships and his poems were often um, influenced by some of these relationships. You know, he was someone who never, for whatever reason, managed to settle down. And sometimes he would be seeing, you know, multiple women at the same time, but he never married. He never had children and that becomes really important to this poem. Um, he predominantly spent his life um, as a librarian here, the head librarian at the University of Hull until he died in 1985. So he never married, never had children, never really travelled. And he spent his life pretty much having these short term relationships with women, being a librarian and um, writing poetry of which he interestingly had no real interest in being famous of but you know people thought highly of his poetry and he was offered the chance to be poet laureate in 1984 but he declined now remember po many of the poet poets we've looked at have been poet laureates the sort of nation's best poets um, including simon armitage who's our current poet laureate who wrote the manhunt philip larkin wasn't interested in any of those things and this sort of added to his reputation for being solitary and a loner, no sort of interest in being famous or being part of public life. So his poems in general are observational. So it's not necessarily writing about what he's experienced. He's writing on what he is observing. And that becomes really relevant to afternoons. He's not writing about something he has experienced himself. He's writing about something he feels he has observed. So he's really giving his opinion and judgment on something he doesn't understand because he hasn't experienced it himself. They tend to focus on everyday life and relationships. So again, there's nothing overly fantastical or extraordinary in the subject of his poems. They tend to be rather mundane and rather ordinary. And people often consider his poetry to be rather miserable, negative and sort of melancholic, um, sad. So I'm possibly really building up the anticipation for the poem that we're, we're about to read um, by telling you it's often miserable. Um, another thing to think about is that this poem was written in the 1960s and life in the 1960s was um, rather sexist. Gender roles were very regimented. The men were the ones that went out to work. Women stayed at home with the children and they focused on the domestic tasks, you know, cooking their um, husband dinner, making sure the house was tidy, looking after the children. Also, at this time, the government was taking steps to get rid of rundown housing and was replacing it with sort of modern council estates that had often these green spaces. And, you know, when I view um, the sort of estate that's mentioned in this poem, I view your sort of idea of these blocks of, you know, newly built flats um, for these sort of working class families. And then you have this big sort of open green recreation ground, almost like this shared garden space for all of these families. So we're going to now annotate the poem and I'm going to switch to the visualizer. Remember, if you don't have your anthology or you can't print the poem, it doesn't matter. You can just make notes on a separate piece of paper and then we can transfer this to your anthology when we are back in school. OK, so as always, we're going to look at the title of the poem and we're going to think of this title. as a metaphor for the different stages of life. So what we see Larkin doing here with this idea of afternoon, but also with this idea of autumn, 
that we're going to pick up on in a minute, we see him doing something very, very similar to what John Keats does in um, To Autumn. And To Autumn and Afternoon are really good poems to compare to one another because they are both using time and they're both using the seasons to be um, symbolic or to be a metaphor for something other than just the season. So we know John Keats in Afternoons, sorry, in To Autumn is using the the cycle of the seasons to be the cycle of life and death. Philip Larkin's doing something similar. He's using the times of the day and the seasons to represent the different stages of a person's life. So we're going to think of mourning for spring, if you like. This is, you know, childhood and youth you know, maybe even up to being a teenager. Okay, so the morning of your life, the, the spring of your life, if you like, the metaphorical spring of your life, birth, childhood, being a youth, being a teenager. Then we get to the afternoon or summer. This is, you know, early adulthood think you know 20s maybe going into your 30s so again stereotypically what are the things that happen during this time well your sort of 20s in your 30s tend to stereotypically be the time where you might get married you might have children you might buy a house you might settle down so you know typically eventually by the time people get into their 30s or their late 30s, they maybe have done or tried to do one of, you know, one of those things. They're considered the sort of start of adulthood, if you like. Then we have, you know, um, I'm going to call it sort of early evening, you know, dusk. Or we have autumn. We think of this as almost late adulthood. When we looked at to autumn, we looked at this idea of, you know, 50 plus, maybe even retirement. And then we have nights or winter which is essentially death, <laughs> which is nice and cheerful. If I was good at drawing, I'd draw a little Grim Reaper there. I'm not very good at drawing, but you may so choose to. So we can see here, and again, Philip Larkin and John Keats will not have been the first nor the last to use the times of the day or the seasons to represent the cycle of life. So it's basically, you know, or symbolise, remember, is our better word. You know, it's basically this the cycle of a human's life. And that is essentially the most basic fundamental part of human nature. We will go through, we will age, and different age brackets tend to represent different stages in your stereotypical life. And again, I use the word stereotypical because, of course, everyone chooses to live their life in different ways some people will want to be mothers and fathers some people will not some people will want to settle down and get a career and buy a house some people might want to live a wonderful nomadic life and travel around the world and live in a caravan or a camper van you know we don't all make the same choices in life so but stereotypically people tend to do these things now we can see based on the title, that this is roughly where we're looking at. But actually what this poem is doing is it's almost looking at this strange little time in between. These, the subject of the poem, which are these young mothers that we're gonna to get to in a minute, they're here, but actually, this is almost what they're going towards. Now they've 
had children, now they've had got married, now they've settled down, all they really have to look forward to is essentially the autumn and winter of their lives. And you'll see that this is a very negative poem. As we learned from the context, Philip Larkin's poetry does tend to be um, very negative. And maybe it's because I am a mother myself. Maybe it's because Philip Larkin was never even a father, let alone a mother. Um, but this poem sort of annoys me, if I'm honest with you. And it's very unlike me to say that um, I'm not particularly fond of any of the things we do in class, because of those of you that have me as a teacher know that I tend to say that I love everything all the time, which I mostly do. Um, and actually, I do think this is a very effective, very clever, very well written poem. Um, doesn't mean I agree with anything that he's saying and that I don't actually find it as a woman and a mother slightly um, offensive. So that's what I mean, really, when I say I don't like it very much. It's not that I don't think it's a good poem because it wouldn't be in, in the anthology if it wasn't an effective, well-written poem. But I find the subject of the poem, um, particularly written by someone like Philip Larkin, who couldn't sustain a long term relationship or had no interest in sustaining a long term relationship, never fathered a child, never um, watched someone properly mother a child. Um, I find it sort of irritating that he's talking about something that he doesn't particularly understand. Um, but that's just me. And remember, it is important to have a personal response to these poems. You don't have to like them all. That's OK. What you do have to do is to be able to have a close reading of them, break them down, analyse them and to justify and explore your personal opinion, which is what we're going to do to this poem. So this idea of afternoons is quite interesting because it's giving us this idea that of monotony. Every afternoon is the same. Think back to that key word from the start. We know if something's monotonous, then it's always the same. It never changes. So it's already negative. It's already got this sort of negative feeling before we've even started. So, summer is fading. And we've got that sort of colon there. Now, this is quite interesting because what it's doing is it's sort of making a declaration here. Summer is over. But we can look at that symbolically as well. So this declaration creates a sort of um, neutral observational tone. And again, we know Philip Larkin's poetry was typically observational. He's writing about things he's observing, not necessarily things that he has any detailed or emotional knowledge about. So how else could we say summer is fading? Well, if we're saying that summer represents early adulthood, he's almost saying this is, this is symbolising the best time of their lives is over you know this sort of early adulthood establishing yourself in the world you're you know young attractive maybe you know there's almost this idea of summer is fading adding into this negativity this idea that maybe the best time of your life your youth you know he's basically saying you know your youth is over and actually ahead of you is old age and death basically so yeah it's a really nice cheerful poem this one the leaves fall in one and twos from trees bordering the new recreation ground now do you remember in when we talked about the context we looked at this idea of um 
sort of newly built estates. Um, and again, part of those estates would be a recreation of ground. So we're looking at a new park that's been built. Because, you know, typically um, in these estates, particularly if they were in a city, they weren't necessarily all individual houses. They were often maybe blocks of flats. And as part of, you know, a, a, low, a block of flats, there would be almost possibly a shared recreation space where all of the mothers, again, typically because we're the 1960s, um, and it would be the mothers that would be at home with the children, the mothers would take their children out of their you know, estate flat down to the recreation ground in the afternoon. Again, almost part of this routine. Um, so as always with poems, there's a couple of ways we can look at this. You could say, that this is an image of control because you've got this idea that these trees would have been planted deliberately you know these aren't trees that would have grown there naturally these are trees that would have been planted there on the edge of this recreation ground um, to almost box it in you know they would have been um, shipped over from somewhere else so it's really interesting, this border, this idea of a border is almost, um, it's almost prison-like. Of, you know, these trees all around the edge. It's basically, you know, Philip Larkin saying, suburban life is controlling. By suburban, we mean this idea of, you know, living in the city, being at home with your children. This is a, a controlling, restrictive, or res restricted, a controlling, restricted life that these mothers are leading. So then we have in hollows of afternoons, young mothers assemble. Now there's two things we're gonna cut or several things. We've got hollows, young mothers, and assemble. Now, if we look at the word hollow, if something's hollow, it's typically empty. So you could interpret this that actually, you know, their lives are empty. So Philip Larkin's creating a very negative idea of motherhood here. You know, motherhood is something that causes your youth, the summer of your life to fade. It is something that is controls you, something that restricts you. It is an empty, hollow existence. And he reinforces this with this idea of the young mothers. You know, they now have no identity. other than mother and again this is the 1960s the fact that it was very typical for um, women to have no other ambition other than be at home with your child take care of the domestic chores now there's nothing wrong with that if that is your choice but of course it was the absence of choice that is the issue here. Nowadays, you would like to think that we bring girls, young girls up to think you can choose to have children, you can choose not to have children. You can choose to have a career for yourself and then put that career on hold to raise your children. You can choose to have a career, have a child, let someone else look after that child and go back to your career or you can choose to let your husband support you and to stay at home with your child but you'd like to think nowadays we give girls the option to do any of those things that they want but in the 1960s they didn't really have that choice and girls that did work were typically um 
in very domestic injuries or if you were lucky you might be a secretary I remember my mother telling me that when she was young and my mother was born in 1958 that as she was growing up her father and mother told her that she should either open a hairdresser's or be a secretary and that was as far as she was told the the job opportunities that were open to her as a as a woman as a girl so it's really interesting to think that in the 1960s don't seem like that long ago but actually how much things have changed then so you read this poem and it does come across as very dated it comes across as very sexist and very misogynistic remember misogyny is people often men looking down on women because it was written in the 1960s when we had those attitudes to women or people had those attitudes to women so it's really interesting here that these young mothers have been stripped of their identities they are only mothers essentially so then we have the word assemble now i really like this i think it's very clever because it's again giving this image of monotony almost like a routine you know think about when the fire alarm goes off you all monotonously assemble um where where you know where we're told to in the playground it's just one of those things that has to happen so it is almost like you know you think of assembling as being back at school or lining up for an assembly or some sort of inspection so it's an interesting choice of word here so young mothers assemble at swinging sandpit, setting free their children. Now this is quite interesting because it's suggesting domestic life. It's like a cage. So, you know, these, these women, these children are shut indoors, probably in these flats. Um, it's a very caged off, restricted life. And then suddenly in the afternoon, they can let these children sort of run around the swings, run around. Um, as again, someone that has two small children, it does make me laugh because it does get to the point where if a child is trapped indoors, you do need to let them outside in a big open space to just run off some energy now what's quite interesting here as well is this idea of the enjambment and remember enjambment is where there is no um punctuation at the end of a line you can see it is only with the colon here and the full stop here and the full stop here that we have any of that punctuation so what you could say here and i'm running out of space really so i'm going to sort of put it in in a little box You know, you could say that the enjambment is showing how relentless and monotonous their lives are because everything is just sort of there's so many expectations of them they've got to get the children up look after the children make the children breakfast wash the dishes wash the clothes hoover the floors again make sure the children are okay play with the children take the children out to play get them back in make them dinner get them ready for get them ready for bed get the dinner ready on the table for the husband clean up again no it's a very relentless very monotonous existence and you could argue that that's the effect of the enjambment here it's showing that there's always something for these mothers to do and they're never really doing it for themselves they're doing it for their children they're doing it for their household they're doing it for their husbands but what they're not doing is anything for themselves um, which is an interesting way of sort of analyzing the effect of that structure of the enjambment so stanza two then so we open um, here with a prepositional phrase which is basically referring to 
their husbands. Um, it's suggesting that their husbands um, are distant from them. And this is reinforced here by the caesura behind them at intervals stand husbands in skilled trades so it's like these husbands are behind them at an interval at a distance away you know the husbands will be out again working hard to provide for their families the wife will very much be doing the domestic work there's a distance between those gender roles there's no sharing of bringing the money in. There's no sharing of the washing, looking after the children. Those gender roles create a distance and a divide between the wife and the husband here. And that caesura, that comma, is almost a physical representation of that distance, as is, again, the other comma, this other phrase, at intervals, that there is a distance between them. So skilled trades. Um, he's talking about the working class. Again, skilled trades are often um, manual labourers, builders, plumbers, carpenters. You could interpret this as Larkin being classist. What we mean by classist is basically looking down at the working class. So not only do we have a poem that is largely sexist in tone, even if that sexism is just representing the sexism of society at the time, we also have a poem that is classist, um, arguably as well. The way he, he's not focusing on middle or upper class families here, he's focusing on working class families. You know, the women live in estates, the husbands are in skilled trades. So there's a real air of judgment in this poem as well. Now, this is a really interesting phrase and it always does, is one that sticks in my mind in this poem, an estate full of washing. So what these women have in their houses is basically never-ending um, domestic chores. It's like their whole flat, the whole estate is just filled with washing, you know, washing clothes, washing counters, washing dishes, just again, this monotonous, boring, endless, restrictive domestic life. And no matter how hard they work, there's always something left to do. It never ends and every day is the same. And that's why, again, we're thinking of monotony, that first word that we learned at the start of the lesson. It is a monotonous, hard, exhausting existence, really. And an estate full of washing is a really clever way of showing that. And the albums lettered our wedding are lying near the television. Now this is really interesting because our wedding will have been, you know, probably at the start of the, you know, symbolic afternoon of their life. And again, stereotypically particularly in the 1960s or before you would get married then you would have children so you know it's to do with you know a pre-child existence really when they were still in the early afternoon of their life rather than the late afternoon of their life going into you know the even more boring stage of adulthood here but the fact that the wedding album is lying near the television, again, is very clever because it's showing that, you know, their love 
has diminished, you know, and is taken for granted here because um, the television is just, you know, something that you would sit and watch either by yourself or maybe together, but you might not really be talking to one another, you're actually not really spending time with one another. You're just sort of distracting yourself um, from, you know, the hardness of your life, maybe. So the fact that it's lying near the television is this idea that they're taking their sort of love and their relationship for granted. So it's, again, got negative connotations that having children has negatively affected their marriage as well. Now, what's interesting here is that, as we know, Philip Larkin was um, unsuccessful in love. He may have got engaged a couple of times, but that never actually manifested itself into that lasting marriage. So he could be reflecting his own sort of bitterness, if you like, or negativity um, by saying that their love has mellowed, their love has been affected by having children. So then finally in this stanza, before them, the wind is ruining their courting places. Now a courting is again this old fashioned um, phrase really for when you first start sort of, sort of going out with someone, if you like. So um, courting would be sort of... Um, is referring to the place they would go basically the sort of hangout for older teenagers maybe you know where you where you would go and take a little walk hand in hand, have a little kiss maybe, you know, those sorts of places. So that's what it's, um, but what we've got now, the wind is ruining their courting places. Um, but do we actually mean the wind here? The, the wind here could sort of be, you know, the passing of time. Because what we are what we essentially have is the passing of time is ruining their coursing places because their life has moved on they're not in that early stage of a relationship when they're first going out and first getting to know each other they've moved beyond that stage now as is natural with the passing of time they're into the late afternoon of their life rather than the early afternoon or the late spring of their life when they were courting so when you talk about the wind is ruining their courting places, actually it's the passing of time because they were never going to be able to stay in that stage forever. Okay, so now we will look at the third verse where this idea of courting places is continued. So before them, the wind is ruining their courting places that are still courting places, but the lovers are all in school now what we have here which is quite interesting is the brackets emphasizing sorry i can't write today emphasizing his point that a new generation will follow in their footsteps so there is a new generation who are still in school they're still in the spring of their life who will go to the same courting places that this couple did and their lives will turn out exactly the same they'll get married they'll have children and their love will diminish their love will become hollow their lives will become hollow so what he's saying here is that life is monotonous people follow the same path 
which is ultimately disappointing. So it's very cynical and negative view on life. You know, generation on generation of children will follow in this exact same path and they will experience the misery and the monotony of domestic life just like this couple essentially so yeah nice cheerful poem you can maybe see why i might have issues with it slightly and their children so intent on finding more unripe acorns expect to be taken home now what we have here is an image of youth you know the children um, the children are still you know they're still young and carefree they're in the spring of their life so you know they're not ready To take over from their parents but that's what is in their future again this monotonous cycle you know they are the unripe acorns and of course an acorn we know is the seed of an oak tree so we've got more you know these sort of images of spring or these images of youth here so the children expect to be taken home now this is quite interesting as well because it's giving us the impression that the mother's needs are secondary to that of the children's which again is continuing on with this idea of the negativity you know the children are more important which is of course true when you are looking after small children their needs have to be important of your own but it's almost this sort of mar he's presenting motherhood as being like this martyr-like thing you know you have to sacrifice your own needs your own wants your own desires everything about yourself to be a mother and that's just not true that's actually a very male very sexist view of motherhood but again we have to excuse it slightly because this is a poem written in the 1960s when that was culturally very normal but it's this idea that you can be a mother and that is all that is all that has to define your life is a very sexist and a very dated one as well so then we have and this always just i don't know riley makes me laugh their beauty has thickened now thickened is a really strange and insulting way of putting it actually because what he's doing is he's criticizing the women's physical appearance um you know pregnancy childbirth <laughs> age is causing their attractiveness to fade <laughs> sorry i find it really hard to annotate this poem with a straight face sometimes pregnancy childbirth age is causing their attractiveness to fade so it's actually again a very sexist sort of views this idea of thickening obviously of course as you get older your appearance changes that is inevitable when you are pregnant it is inevitable that your body is going to change because you're growing a human being inside you um, and again a result of being a mother means you might have less time to eat well less time to exercise less time to take care of yourself because it's tough but it's really interesting, again, the negativity. It's not just saying about all of the effects it will have on your life, your time, your priorities. It's also going to make you more unattractive motherhood, basically. 
So then finally in this jolly little poem, um, something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. Now what we have here is ending with a very sort of vague statement. He's not saying what it is. However, we could um, basically interpret it is it's probably motherhood. You know, this predominantly seems to be a negative poem about the effects that motherhood have had on these women, essentially. Now, as he is neither a, a woman or a mother, it's quite interesting that he thinks he knows all of this. Um, but anyway, um, and it's this idea of pushing them to the side of their own lives. It's linking back to the idea that their lives don't matter anymore. This idea that these children are almost like parasites that are sucking all the youth and attractiveness and life and vitality and chances and opportunities um, out of them basically you know they are no longer important and they are no longer relevant and what's quite interesting as well is all of the again the sort of caesura here because we have these sorts of repetition of these four stops and it's creating you know this sense of finality you know again they can't escape the monotony of this life or this path you know their lives themselves are restricted it's inescapable so it ends very negatively as well now you could view this poem as larkin sort of justifying his own choices to be unmarried to not have children because actually he doesn't want to put his own life on hold although you could argue being a man he wouldn't have been the one that would have been at home with the children at the time anyway um but again, you can sort of see maybe where I was coming from at the start, where I said, whilst I do think actually it is an effective and a clever poem and look at everything we've written about it, it's quite hard as a, as a woman to not find it incredibly sexist and also as a mother not to find it pretty ridiculous um, and offensive as well. So I will be interested to hear um, your thoughts on this poem and if we were in class, I would hope that some of you would feel sort of rather outraged as well like me so finally now we've annotated the poem what does afternoon and the season of autumn symbolize in the poem so what is philip larkin using that to symbolize and how does larkin present the monotony of the mother's lives in the poem Okay, well done guys and I will see you either in school, hopefully, it's really lovely being to see some of you in the classroom or um, in our video next week.